Okay, I guess we get going. And uh, we, we have a long laundry list for the last uh, lecture, but uh, I don't think it'll take that long. So we'll see how long it takes. Uh, this time we have to talk about stat thermal a little bit, just a tiny bit, resonance response, and then line shapes. A little bit about line shapes, not too much. So I wanted to do a very quick review of stat thermo. Has anybody ever taken a stat thermo class in a physical chemistry department? Yeah, man, it, it go, it's serious. I mean, the, the kind of stat thermo that you study in mechanical engineering is not as serious as that stuff. That's really amazing. Uh, so uh, I'm sure that a, a, a serious physical chemist uh, professor would laugh at my presentation, but I'm just trying to remind you what, what we use when we do uh, spectroscopy. Then I want to talk about resonance response, including the Einstein A coefficient and then all the rest of them. And, and that kind of gets at that issue of why do we have all these different ways of describing the same thing. And then talk a little bit about line shapes. So statistical mechanics gives us the fraction of molecules in each of the individual energy levels when it's in thermal equilibrium. And that's important because, as I said before, uh, when we measure concentration using a uh, laser technique, uh, especially a narrow band laser technique, uh, we're often just looking at one energy level. We're going to pump a molecule from one level to the next level, so we're only hitting that lower level. And we, know, we need to know wh what fraction is in that level so we'll know what the total concentration is. Resonance response has to also do with uh, how strongly a molecule reacts. And so that goes back to even the Lorentz atom and the imaginary index. That imaginary index idea is what tells you how strongly will it respond uh, to the light when it's resonant. So we've, already, we've spent some time talking about the horizontal axis. Actually, we've spent two lectures talking about the horizontal axis. And uh, when my former advisor did this class, I think he spent maybe three or four lectures talking about the horizontal axis. You can go on. We were just talking about some other details that I left out. I purposely decided to just call it to a halt at a certain point and say, that's enough. If you really need to go do this, you will sit down and read all the details. I was just trying to give you a feeling for how much gets involved. Now we want to talk about the vertical axis uh, and those two things, uh, stat mech and resonance response, determine the vertical axis. And once again, these are stick spectra without line broadening. And line broadening is something you can't avoid. So you recall from thermodynamics that uh, temperature is actually a representation of the internal energy that we talk about. So uh, at a particular temperature, a molecule is not going to occupy all of the energy levels that are available to it. You know, when I was showing those potential wells, I was showing all these energy levels. It's not going to occupy all of them. It's going to occupy a distribution of them, uh, but not all of them. So the energy in the molecule is going to be partitioned then among uh, various modes available for energy storage, like uh, actually kinetic energy, certainly, and then vibration and rotation and so forth. So the kinetic energy of the molecule, I'm sure you've all seen this before, is given by the Maxwellian distribution function. It's, that's actually the velocity of the molecule, but that's uh, controlled by kinetic energy. So it's just given by this expression here, which is a Gaussian expression. Fv is the fraction of molecules with the velocity amplitude given by that. M is the molecular mass. Kb is Boltzmann's constant, which is like an ideal constant per molecule. And that's it. And I'm sure you've all been through that before in some sort of first level thermo class in graduate school. These internal modes, vibrational and rotational and electronic also, are, they're quantized. The ground state down here in the electronic level is, uh, has a collection of modes. And this, this is uh, what I'm calling a ground state here. Those modes are occupied uh, at room temperature, not all of them. This is just a cartoon representation, of course. I didn't actually sit down and figure out the, the <laughs> populations in the different levels. Uh, as we get it warmer, it moves up and it broadens, and it goes even hotter when you get up to a hot state. Okay? So the distribution widens and moves up. It sort of depopulates the lower levels, moves up, widens, uh, and populates other levels. And uh, I'm not familiar with any molecules that actually occupy an excited uh, electronic state uh, just from 
a temperature distribution. A plasma can do that, for example. That well, plasma will do all kinds of things, but that's different. I'm not talking about plasmas. So the distribution of energy across those modes, electronic vibrational rotation, is given by Boltzmann statistics. And that energy distribution function is this, where that's the fraction of molecules in the energy level I, which is the number in I divided by N. That's why you need this. You're going to tune the laser to, to some uh, molecule that's populated with this N sub I. What you're trying to measure is N. So you need to know this fraction. And it's given by this, where that's a degeneracy of that level. This is an uh, uh, exponential of, a, of an energy state for that level. And Q is what's called the partition function. Uh, okay, so the question was, uh, um, when we're measuring temperature, you're talking about when we measure temperature spectroscopically. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so when, we, when we're measuring temperature spectroscopically, we talk about electronic, vibrational, and rotational energy levels and how those uh, can be detected to determine a temperature. What about uh, translation? Well, translation is not quantized, so you're not going to see specific behaviors at specific lines, right? The only way that, that translation comes into a uh, spectroscopic measurement is through Doppler broadening, and that's it. So actually, the internal energy is definitely going to contain uh, a large amount of uh, kinetic energy in the molecules. You will not observe that kinetic energy except for Doppler broadening. So it's not going to affect populations in rotational or vibrational levels. Other questions? I got time for a story. <laughs> so I, I graduated from high school in Montana. So I go to the University of Minnesota to undergraduate school. It was 1970. Very first class, it was 7.30 in the morning, it was calculus. And I walk in and sit down next to a hippie, which, you know, in those days, there were lots of hippies. I sit down next to this hippie. And the bell rings. There's no professor. The hippie gets up, stands up there, and goes, I'm your professor. I'm sick and tired of all this. Uh, this is the last time I'm going to be teaching. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to quit and go make cabinetry. And then he said, uh, there will be no exams. Uh, no, there will be exams, but we're not going to grade them. I will give you exams, and if you want to, you can take it. If you'd like to, you can grade it, because I'll give you the solution. If you'd like to tell me what you got, you can tell me, and then I will tell you what everybody in the class got. Then you'll know how well you're doing. Uh, and at the end of this course, uh, you will decide what your grade was. <laughs> it's like I'm going, <laughs> it's like, not on the first day. <laughs> and, and the reason I was, I was reminded of that story is there was a guy in the back. He was my age, but he was wearing a suit. You know, we're talking 1970, right? It's a suit. And he gets up and pulls out a camera and takes a picture of the professor. And the professor walked up to the back of the class. This was film camera, right? Opens up the back, zhik, <laughs> exposes it to room, you know, and tells the guy to leave the class. Once again, it's like, <laughs> Could you save that for maybe the second class or No. You don't have any <laughs> uh. But he did he did warn us, he said, you know, there will be uh, calculus two and you're never gonna survive in that if you don't actually learn calculus one. Anyway, back, what were we talking about? Oh, yeah. So the partition functions are given here. This is an electronic partition function, where that's the uh, degeneracy of that state and the energies and so forth. So uh, we're going to get the ENs uh, from a table somewhere. Somebody's measured that. And vibrational is given this way, where, well, you can actually use whatever you want to. You can use more sophisticated expressions for the vibrational energy if you like. I, I put the more simple one here. Use, which, use what you think is appropriate. It depends on the molecule you're looking at, right? You have to read about the molecule you're looking at. So the fraction then of uh, molecules in that vibrational level is given by this. 
Rotational partition function looks like this. Once again, this is the simple-minded energy and the rotational levels. Uh, that's the, this is the um, nuclear degeneracy. That's the rotational degeneracy, those two there. And, and you see that the nuclear degeneracy, which is going to be a fixed number, is buried inside this partition function. It'll end up up here, too. And like I said, for, for the kind of spectroscopy that we do, it ends up falling out. So that may be why you never learned about it even. So the fraction of molecules in a particular ro rotational vibrational level looks like this. And you can find all of these terms in different uh, uh, manuals and uh, journal articles and so forth. So here's a carbon monoxide uh, uh, spectrum looking at line strengths and populations. So again, this is wave, this is wave numbers now. This is, this is for uh, 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 a 0, 1 transition, no electronic transition in this case, looking at a lot of different rotational transitions, okay? So what's the, uh, what's the electronic state? There's no Q branch. It's a sigma, right? And sigmas don't have a Q branch. Anyway, there's no Q branch. So if you look at this, this is at 300 kelvins, and look at the populations there. Now this is at 1,000 kelvin. This is uh, 2150 about right there. 2150 is sitting here. So what's happened? This whole thing has moved to a different wavelength region. It's going up to uh, higher J's, right? It's moving up to higher J's. And we, so what we did is we kind of like took population down and put population up. But notice it's also much broader, right? Going between those two temperatures. So this thing, like the imaginary index, that line strength changes. Uh, it can change a little bit across these lines, but not a lot. <coughs> it's, but the, the, bi the biggest uh, contributor to these, the change in the spectrum is the Boltzmann distribution in the ground states, or I'm sorry, in the lower states. This would be like an absorption spectrum. So we're, look, we're probing the populations in the lower state that's going to absorb the laser, say. And notice that there's actually a hot band there. That's, that's for from V1 to V2. So the, the change in that spectrum is really a representation of Boltzmann statistics, and that's how you measure temperature with a laser, if you can do it. So probably the most uh, simple-minded way to do it is to look at two lines that are right next to each other that have a, they have a ratio that changes. Their, their peak ratios change a lot with temperature. You go seeking a set of lines that do that. And then maybe you have a very rapidly scanned narrow band laser that will resolve both lines at the same time. For example, you can see both those peaks and take a ratio. I have a question. The theory that you measure the temperature by a laser, it, it depends on the Boltzmann uh, distribution. But if we change the temperature, how long the molecule, molecules will take to, to, uh, to redistribute from the lower state to a higher state? Um, oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. um, the, the question is, uh, if we change temperatures, how long does it take for the Boltzmann distribution to reorient itself? Uh, that would happen on the order of uh, collision times. What are they anyway? I don't remember now. It's been a long time. It would have to be much faster than, than flow times or things like that that you're looking at. Pardon? A, a yeah, it would be on the order of picoseconds, yeah. Hundred, maybe uh, I'd have to sit down and think about it. It has, it has to do with the, uh, uh, boy, it's been a long time. I, I used to know what molecular velocities were, but boy, that's gone, that's gone a long way. You have to sit down and work out the molecular velocity and then figure out, you know, the mean free path. How long does it take to get across a mean free path? That's how it starts to redistribute the energy. But I'm sure it's much faster than anything we would be looking at in a flow. <coughs> so that's how we measure temperature. But actually, that's actually an interesting question uh, because. Um, there are other cases, that's not one of the cases, but there are other cases where uh, you do actually have to worry about the distribution not being Boltzmann. Uh, somebody was talking to me about a plasma, for example. Those distributions will not be Boltzmann. 
um, there was a case where uh, it, there was a long time ago when people were trying to uniformly heat a gas so that they could look at uh, auto ignition chemistry and so what they did is uh, they used a carbon dioxide laser that was blown up into a collimated beam and went through a cell and CO2 lasers emit in the, uh, in the infrared around 10 microns and the idea was to dump energy into vibrational modes uh, and uh, look at um, the chemistry, I mean, it would heat the gas doing that, uniformly heat the gas and look at chemistry at the same time. And uh, so they were looking at chemical times, which, you know, we're talking microseconds to milliseconds, and they found that this thing actually re-equilibrated in a Boltzmann sense well before they, uh, they, they had to worry about it affecting chemistry. So it did become a uniform temperature before they had to worry about observing chemistry, but that's a case where they had a non-Boltzmann distribution at first and then it would equilibrate. That technique ended up not working because when you turn that much energy on suddenly it makes an acoustic wave that goes bang, bang, bang and disturbs everything while you're trying to... So how do you dissolve that energy into vibration directly? So even it's absorption. It was absorption. Energy. Well, that's, that was the question, is d what happens? And so they looked at the emission spectrum. Oh, so the question was, uh, how do you know the energy went into those levels and how did it get distributed? They looked at the spectrum of the emission from several different uh, molecules. And you, you, so what you're looking for is a distribution like that, right? You, you disperse that spectrum from some molecule that you're hitting and you see it go non-Boltzmann and then you see it go back to Boltzmann. Okay, we're done with that. Let's talk about resonance response. So, uh, resonance response really has to do with how strongly will this atom or molecule react if we illuminate it with light at the wavelength that corresponds to a transition. So this doesn't have to do with populations at different levels, it's just a particular molecule, if it's in that level, if we hit it with light, how strongly will it react? And we've, uh, we've already discussed resonance response in lectures uh, up to this point. So in lecture one, we talked about an absorption cross-section when we talked about Beer's law the first time. In the same lecture, we talked about the Einstein coefficient for, we called it stimulated absorption, right? And we did that when we were talking about the equation of radiative transfer and LIF. In lecture two, we talked about the equation of radiative transfer and we had the Einstein coefficients, A, B, and this other B, right? We also talked about a volume absorption coefficient, kappa, right? In lecture three, we talked about the Lorentz atom, and we had a, uh, an absorption coefficient, and we also had the uh, imaginary index. We also showed that the imaginary part of the refractive index is related to the oscillator strength, the polarizability, the susceptibility. Somebody was asking about that a while ago. Isn't that the same thing? Yes. And the dielectric constant. We have said nothing so far about the line strength, they call it capital S, that's usually written in terms of partial pressure, or the band strength, that's also a popular way to talk about it. So you'd be justified in asking why are there so many ways to describe the same thing? And it's because there are lots and lots of different communities using spectroscopy, so there, there, are, uh, there are astrophysicists studying emission of light from stars there are chemists studying particular things in their lab, there are material scientists, there are all kinds of people use spectroscopy, physicists, and, and they, I don't know why, but they used to be separated from each other and so they had their own jargon. And, and so now there's like this proliferation of ways to describe exactly the same thing. So you're glad to know, you should be glad to know there's lots of ways that you can, there, you can relate all these to each other without causing a problem, it's possible. Uh, they aren't different from each other. There are just ways to convert from one to the other. It's a little bit complicated, but you can do it. We have to talk about, to do that, we have to talk about this thing called the transition dipole moment. And you're probably not surprised by that because we talked about the dipole moment when we talked about the Lorentz atom. 
So uh, this correspondence principle in quantum mechanics, right? Now we have to talk about a quantum dipole, but it's, it's performing the same kind of function. So the classical approach back in the old days, uh, we talked about Rayleigh scattering. But here the energy levels are actually going to change. So the Lorentz atom would be oscillating, let's say. Let's say somehow we made the Lorentz atom oscillate. And then you can, and this is the classical solution, you get the electron in motion. It's going to emit in this pattern that we've already seen from Rayleigh scattering, except once again it's a dipole. Only now we've changed populations, but now it's going to say relax back down to the ground state, give off light. This is the probability density distribution for which direction the photon will go in. And here's an image taken of by a single molecule microscope looking at individual dye molecules. Okay? So you're looking down on the torus there, and here you're looking at it at the side. Can anybody uh, explain to me what these light and dark bands are? They're interference patterns. This thing is like a dipole that keeps giving off light because they keep pumping it so they can get enough light to take a picture. And so the coherence between these emitted photons is causing these interference patterns. But it's the torus. This is that torus, looking at it from the top and looking at it from the side. So these are patterns from individual molecules. And it depends on the orientation of the dipole moment, right? Sort of like what it did in Rayleigh scattering. And then this, this center in the dark spot, remember when I talked about Rayleigh scattering, I said if you, if you look down at it and you looked at it with uh, zero collection angle, it would look dark, and you can see that. And then these others are, yeah, we're looking at those from the side. Hmm. These emission patterns are polarized along the dipole axis. Now, have you ever thought about that while you're doing LIF? So emission from individual atoms and molecules can be polarized. So this molecule was excited, uh, it was optical pumping, but now we're not scattering like with Rayleigh scattering. It has a lifetime. And in a gas, especially a flame, these things are rotating very quickly. Okay? So that when they, can rot they rotate away from the orientation that absorbed the laser light, and then they emit. So molecular scattering is really fast. It doesn't change populations, and it's cleanly polarized. Laser-induced fluorescence is not because it, it can rotate away from that is in in the uh, in a gas phase that is. So this classical approach uh, of dipole emission is to treat this like an antenna. We use Maxwell's equations to do what I talked about before. We write these uh, scalar fields and potentials. We apply vector calculus to generate expressions for the uh, electric field, that's the electromagnetic field that's coming out. And then we apply Poynting's theorem to turn that into uh, an irradiance. And th this is all uh, in my book again, but we get this, I we get a classical solution for the Einstein coefficient given by this, where that's a classic electric dipole moment right there. So the Einstein coefficient goes as uh, the magnitude of the classical electric dipole moment squared. But the classical Lorentz atom solutions are, they're not really accurate. We want to look at a quantum mechanically correct expression for A, so we have to think about this transition dipole moment. So we talk about the quantum mechanical matrix element of the dipole moment written this way. But what does that mean? How many of you have seen that expression before? That's a bra and that's a ket, okay? That's, that's in direct notation, it's called. That's shorthand for the inner product. So you remember inner products from vector calculus. What this really is is an integral from minus infinity to infinity of fork uh, sub n. I want to make sure I get the notation the same. over what configuration space, I just put S, 
I forget right now. That's an inner product, right? And, and what we're doing is, when you think about it, the, those wave functions are the probability amplitude, okay? So this is the probability uh, of, a, of a change from one state to the next state. That's what that describes, the inner product. So the, these functions, the wave functions are probability amplitudes. So it's an expectation value for a transition dipole moment between those two states. So this is called a matrix element because if you think about it in terms of a molecule, there are lots and lots of states. There are lots and lots of M's and N's, right? And so because of quantum mechanics, because these things can occupy only discrete states, quantum mechanics lends itself completely to matrix mechanics because of that. So you will, everything will be described in terms of matrix mechanics, and this Dirac notation is a really nice shorthand way to, to keep track of the matrix mass. In fact, these, these, the bras and the kets are actually written, if you write them out in terms of matrix mechanics, the, the bra is a column vector if you think in terms of matrix math, and then the ket is a row vector. And then this is a two by two matrix that they're multiplied by, and it's a, it gives you a probability distribution. And, and each, each, each uh, component of the, uh, of the uh, vectors is a representation of the wave function for a particular state. So the quantum mechanical expression for A and M ends up being this, which is neat because that's actually being true to correspondence between uh, classical states and uh, quantum mechanical expressions. Now we just like fudged and stuffed that in there, but you can actually, you can, in my book we worked it out using what are called the density matrix equations of quantum mechanics. We actually worked out the solution for an Einstein B coefficient and then from that you can get the A coefficient and you get exactly the same answer without, without taking a classical solution and inserting a quantum solution. So there's more than one way to show this. This was just a fast way to do it so we don't spend all evening here. So what happened to all the orientational math from Rayleigh scattering, right? We had to worry all about direction cosines and all this stuff and we, ju we just like walked straight past that. Well, this one-third has to do with uh, the rotations of these molecules in space. So if you're going to average the contributions from lots and lots of molecules all rotating in space, you get a one-third. It works out that way. So the major difference here is that, that scattering, we have excitation and re-radiation almost in instantaneously, but in absorption and fluorescence, they're distinct processes separated in time. So scattering, including Rayleigh and Raman, very fast. Excitation, scattering with uh, absorption or fluorescence, it's, it's a much longer process. So that's just for the, the spontaneous emission part of the process. One outcome of this is that that explains, it's this, uh, this inner product here that tells us things like uh, we can't have matched parity in a, in a transition from one to the other because that'll drive the inner product to zero. It'll tell us other, other cases where we're never going to see a transition. And that's where you get these forbidden transition rules, right? The, this inner product, this integration is going to go to a zero. And, and you can figure out physically why. So, an example we already talked about before, these homonuclear molecules like that, there's no resonance response, so we don't see them. <clears throat> we could use that same equation for, you know, we didn't actually, we didn't actually say what this is yet, right? What's it for? Is it for an electronic transition or for a rotational transition or what? We didn't actually say. So we could use it uh, for, for vibration, say. All it has to do is knowing the dipole matrix element and you can get what it is you're searching for. So equation 31, we, we, we were talking about it in terms of an electronic transition. 
But electronic transitions can also include at the same time a transition in rotational and vibrational states. So the question is, do we want to make a gigantic set of tables, you know, one value of mu for each one of those transitions, which that just seems horrendous. That's not how we do it. So we're going to take advantage of the separation of variables that you get from Born-Oppenheimer. So we're going to find an electronic matrix element, and we're going to write it this way. It's the inner product using just an electronic dipole matrix element. And that actually uh, is uh, a more straightforward thing to do. Mm. Then what we have to do is deal with the contributions of vibration and rotation in addition to what we just did. So that's actually going to give us uh, a measure of the strength of an electronic response by itself. Almost as though we had such a broadband laser it was going to it was going to cover all possible vibrational and rotational transitions all at the same time for a single molecule, which I don't think anybody's ever tried to do that experiment. Let's uh, consider a case where uh, we've managed to hit all of the rotation, uh, rotational transition within a vibrational manifold. So, you know, there would be a vibrational transition, but we have such a broadband laser, it's going to make all of the rotational transitions happen so that we don't have to worry about those. They're all going to go, so now it's really just a vibrational transition. And that's where we get to this thing called the Frank Condon. So the vibrational part, separate from the electronic part, is written this way. We, the dipole matrix element is uh, represented in the uh, electronic solution. So we're talking about an overlap integral between wave functions for levels n and m for a particular vibrational state. And if you think about it, this is literally what's happening. We have an, that's an overlap integral between this particular wave function, which might look, that's, the, that's actually what the lowest level wave function looks like, represented here, and what happens up here. This is a strong overlap. It all has to do with what happened in the upper electronic state. How did it move around, right? And in which vibrational level are we trying to get to? The overlap between this state and that, that uh, V prime equals zero state is basically zero and it's not going to happen. But that's just a cartoon I drew to sort of uh, exaggerate what it is we're talking about. So that's the Frank Condon overlap integral and you will find uh, uh, Frank Condon factors published. So in terms of irradiance, that, was the f that, that has to do with uh, wave functions, right? In terms of irradiance, we, we look at the square of that. If you want to talk about rotational transitions, we do something similar. Those are the Honnold-London factors. They look quite a bit like uh, a uh, Frank Condon factor, except you notice this is a, this is a complex conjugate. We didn't do that there because those, the, it turns out that the vibrational uh, wave functions are self-adjoint, so you don't have to, they are the same thing. So you can find these things published for a molecule that you're interested in. So what you do is you go get the electronic uh, dipole, or the electronic response, and then you multiply it by the Frank Condon and the Honnold London factor. So A is then equal to this times those factors. They represent the strengths of the different kinds of uh, transitions. And that way we don't, we don't have to have a huge table filled with a uh, value of mu for every single transition. So you can find those uh, published uh, in the literature or in uh, manuals. From A, you can get the other Einstein coefficients. Now, so there's a, a degeneracy time. This is the Einstein coefficient for uh, stimulated emission. That's for stimulated absorption. These expressions uh, assume thermal equilibrium. But if we can, if we can live with, if, if we can accept that we're at thermal equilibrium, then those expressions apply. So you can get the other Einstein coefficients. If you only need to know one to get the others. So from that, everything else can follow. In the development of the ERT, we inferred a spectral absorption coefficient given by that. Well, we now we know B, 
all the, going all the way back to the dipole matrix element. From the Lorentz atom, we had this classical absorption coefficient. Uh, we said the two were related by an oscillator strength, right? So if we assume we have Einstein coefficients in a quantum mechanically correct way, then the oscillator strength would be written that way. The absorption cross-section was written as a spectral property, so it becomes this. Sometimes people like to talk about a spectrally integrated cross-section, so okay, that's that. Well, people like to use cross-sections when they're talking about scattering because remember when I was talking about scattering before, there was, a, there was an extinction cross-section which include both absorption and scattering. So people who do scattering calculations that involve absorption as well like to use a cross-section, so that's why that's there. So the band strength, uh, that's really uh, uh, related to the Frank Conan and Honnold London factors. So there's an electronic oscillator strength given by this. Then the band strength would be given by that. That's for a vibrational band, ignoring, <coughs> they'll, they'll just give you that thing. Now you have to worry about the rotational part past the point. They'll, they'll give you that, you have to worry about rotation. And so that's how you get that, that's the oscillator strength. And if these are oscillator strengths, so you have to multiply those by the Lorentz atom absorption coefficient to get the thing you wanted. So, uh, I guess the point about that part of the lecture is to tell you that uh, there's actually detailed ways to relate one of those things to the next thing. And this is a case where uh, if you have to go find these things, you have to be very careful. I mean. Where we're talking about oscillator strengths, right? That includes uh, information about uh, a. Um, it's getting late, my brain is frying. Um, what do you call it? The Lorentz atom. That was an electromagnetic solution, right? Hidden in, hidden in a lot of these things are electromagnetic solutions. And electromagnetics use three different uh, unit systems. So if you take a paper from some person, I don't know, at MIT and you combine that with a paper with, for some person from Princeton, they might have used different unit systems. So you have to be very careful when you start to mix and match results from different papers. If you, if you actually have to go find this information yourself, be very careful about not mixing and matching unit systems. Now the nice thing is, is that uh, a database like LiftBase, they've, all, they've sorted all that out for you already. So it's okay to use those kind of databases. Or if there's a, uh, a review article on uh, doing uh, measurements in a certain molecule and they've got it all organized for you, you don't have to worry about it again. But the warning is if, you <coughs> if you're going after a, an unusual molecule, you, you should be aware that, that this potential exists because you, your, your result could be just totally wrong if you don't pay attention to what unit system they used for the different formalisms they're using. It's a pain. It's not my fault. Okay, line broadening. We're going to end up uh, probably uh, quitting 20 minutes early. So we had sticks. We've been just keep showing sticks. Hmm. Uh, and so, yeah, if, if we're just going to use these things at all and not worry about broadening, then stick spectra are appropriate. But if you make a measurement, what you're going to see is there's bandwidth. Now, a little, there's a little bit of a problem with the bandwidth issue is that your instruments also got bandwidth. No matter what, the instrument will have bandwidth. So. Uh, it can be a problem if you're trying to separate out the effects of line broadening. Make sure you do not ignore the fact that your own instrument has got some bandwidth as well and make sure you understand what it is. <coughs> so we have to go back to this uh, uh, line shape function we mentioned a long time ago in the equation of radiative transfer. So you probably recall this from the Lorentz atom. We, we had a Lorentzian line shape and in case you're not familiar with the notation, this is the width of the line. It's called the full width, the full width across there at half maximum. So you go halfway down from the maximum and you measure the width and, and that's the full width half maximum of a line, in case you were unfamiliar with that. 
So line shape matters uh, whenever the spectral resolution of the instrument is higher or about the same as the line width. Uh, if you're just looking at absorption and you're, you're using a fairly broad band source, as long as you're not including more lines than the one line, you can pretend that you've integrated across the entire line and, and maybe you don't have to worry about it. You can just ignore line broadening, but situations like that aren't so common. In the old days, um, let's see, the, the pulsed dye lasers from, from YAGS in the like 80s and 90s, they had a, they had a longer, a slightly broader bandwidth. So they were like uh, 0.7 wave numbers, which that would actually cover one whole absorption line with a fairly flat top in the spectrum. And uh, it was narrow enough, it wasn't hitting a lot of other lines. And so that was a case where you could sort of ignore line broadening. But now those lasers have much narrower uh, line widths. And so now you, that's nice actually, because then you can resolve spectra, but now you have to think about broadening. Uh, so a narrow band laser, especially the, like all the diode laser work that gets done, uh, that will resolve a line. Mm -hmm. Or if you have a, f I knew somebody who used a Fabry Perot Etalon. Anybody ever heard of one of those things? Yeah, it's a one. It's it's a very a two, very narrow bandwidth optical filter that you can scan. And so you like if you want to look at emission spectra and you want to see just a line, you can actually get a Fabry Perot Etalon that will scan across the emission line and can actually be used to resolve spectral features. Uh, that has to be a really specialized Fabry Perot to be that narrow, though. But it can be done. Then you have to worry about the line structure. Uh, as I showed before, the, the integral across the line shape function has to be equal to 1. So when this thing broadens, the peak falls down. And let's say, let's say you're using a narrow band laser that's narrower than the line and it's parked right there. Obviously, when the line shape changes, it's going to be an important <coughs> contributor to changes in the signal that you're measuring. So I just said this, if, if you have a su sufficiently broadband spectrum, you can pretend that you just integrated across this entire thing, and then you just use uh, 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 the spectrally integrated version of the uh, coefficient that you're using, like the Einstein coefficient. But really, the number of times you can do that is a little unusual. So if you're going to develop a model for this function, you have to understand the processes that cause broadening. And I'm only going to talk about two of those today. There are other processes, and I'll, I, I don't have them written down, but I'll, I'll mention a couple of things uh, when we're done. So there's a whole region called homogeneous broadening, uh, and uh, that has to do with this Lorentz, Lorentzian line shape. Okay, when there's a time dependence, a lifetime to something, uh, you're going to get a Lorentzian profile. Uh, and that expression we had for the, the imaginary index of refraction, that had a line shape function built into it. I just didn't talk about it back then. But if we, if we, want, to, if we want to use that, well, here's the, uh, the line shape function for a homogeneous broadening. And this is structured like what was built into that expression. So the H stands for homogeneous. And what that means is that, you know, if, I, if this is my flame, you know, if that's, if that's the flame, and, I, and I, let's say I have a diode laser shooting across it, what that means is, in homogeneous, what that means is every molecule that's going to be addressed by the wavelength of this laser, every molecule that will absorb, is going to respond the same way in wavelength all the way across. That's what, it means by, that's what homogeneous means. So time-based spectral line shapes are homogeneous. In other words, all the way across this flame, they all are having this same time-based thing happen. So there are several time-based processes that lead to a Lorentzian line shape function in real uh, atoms and molecules. There's a thing called natural broadening, which has to do with Heisenberg uncertainty. Like I said, absolutely everything is going to have bandwidth. And so if nothing else, just Heisenberg uncertainty is going to cause a little bit of bandwidth to the line. You don't see that unless you're looking at uh, something at really high vacuum. It's not interacting with anything else. In fact, uh, when, I when I showed that picture of the, the atoms that have been cooled and trapped, they have broadening that's like that because nothing else is interacting with them. We don't see that in combustion. That's way too small. 
Another time-based source is called, uh, uh, we see that in low-pressure flames, for example, is lifetime broadening. So you do see that in low-pressure flames. It has to do with the fact that the excited state has a lifetime, and that's the Einstein coefficient. One over the Einstein coefficient is, is the lifetime. So in that case, the, uh, the width, the full width half maximum of, of a line broadened by lifetime is given by that. So the, the width, the full width half maximum for something that's uh, lifetime broadened is about a megahertz. So you basically have to get rid of other uh, contributors before you see that, but at low pressures you would see it. The main source in flames is called uh, collision or pressure broadening or collisional broadening. So we have to think in terms of quantum mechanics. Um, I wrote this this way. See, there, there are two potential levels here. And there are these, uh, it's a matrix process. There are these uh, uh, off-axis matrix elements called coherences. And they are, they are ways to link one state to the next, okay? And those coherences are called that because they can be coherent with the laser. The coherences are what feed energy from one population to the next, okay? And what happens is if there's a collision, the coherence shifts phase. It's called a dephasing collision. So there's this thing that's an off-axis off -axis member of the matrix that's supposed to feed energy from one level to the next. But if a collision occurs, the phasing between that coherence and the, and the light will shift. And that will cause bandwidths to the response. The laser then has to, be, has to have moved over now to address that. So that's, what, that's where uh, collision broadening comes from. And the, uh, the width of, uh, of that kind of a line is given by this, where gamma is a dephasing rate. That's why it's called dephasing. It's the phasing between the, the coherence and the molecule and the, and the light that's supposed to cause this transition. And then this uh, uh, gamma is the coherence decay rate. And you can actually measure that using femtosecond lasers, you can actually, by doing time-delayed measurements, you can measure the dephasing rate in, in molecules. And it actually, what's cool about that is, people have measured the dephasing rate in a molecule under very specific and controlled conditions, and they actually are able to reproduce the line broadening that you get uh, when, you, when you look at this molecule and scan a, a very, so the difference between a femtosecond pulse and a, a CW narrowband pulse is the femtosecond is very broad, <laughs> in frequency but very short in time, vice versa. Narrowband laser is continuous wave but very narrow in frequency. You get the same answer probing a molecule with both. The one that's narrow bandwidth scans across the line. The one that's very short in time, very broad bandwidth, looks at the dephasing rate and they get the same answer. I always think it's cool when things actually work out because sometimes I think, I, I'm kind of skeptical sometimes, like is that really right? But it's cool when it works out. So you, the rate of dephasing collisions can be written in terms of collision rate. We know what that is from uh, just gas dynamics. And a dephasing cross-section. So you assume a Maxwellian velocity distribution, and you can get this. Now, this term here, uh, people, what people do actually is uh, they measure this thing. They, they, they do very high, highly spectrally resolved measurements of line shapes, or they measure dephasing rates uh, in a time-based system. But, uh, so, so this is a nice expression, but really it's based on measurements. Part of the trouble is uh, if you have different collision partners, it becomes really complex, and that, that is a problem. It all, it w if you think about it, what it really has to do is, uh, it has to do with, once again, electric fields. Whenever these things happen, it's, it's the interactions of electric fields with each other, and so each molecule is going to have a different potential field around it than other molecules. So collision broadened line widths are on the order of 10 uh, gigahertz full width half maximum atmospheric pressure. So this, if you think about it, we said one for natural broadening. Most of the time when we're studying combustion at atmospheric pressure or above, we even ignore natural broadening and just look at uh, uh, collision broadening. 
So inhomogeneous broadening means that certain classes of molecules respond, but other classes don't. So that's why it's called inhomogeneous, and there are different kinds, but for now we'll just talk about Doppler broadening. So if we pass a laser beam across this uh, flame, the, the, it's very simple. Basically, if this is a flame, you know the molecules have very high speed. I couldn't remember what the speed is, but it's high. And, and if a molecule has a component in this direction, it's going to be Doppler shifted up with relative to those uh, wave fronts that are, that are coming from the laser going that way, right? If it has a strong component in that direction, it'll be Doppler shifted down. So in the rest frame of the molecule, it looks like you need to tune the laser, right? That's all that is. So that, that's what I just said right here. So we think about classes of velocity classes when we uh, when we think in terms of uh, uh, Doppler broadening. So we describe Doppler broadening by when you think about it, we have to know what's the velocity distribution in that one direction, right? Well, that's given by uh, the Maxwellian velocity distribution. So we're going to get a Gaussian. You would naturally get a Gaussian because that's the velocity distribution. And so there's, a, there's an expression for the Doppler width, uh, and it's a Gaussian, and that's, that's the full width half maximum. So it's a very strong function of temperature. In fact, people sometimes have tried to use Doppler broadening as a way to measure temperature, but the trouble is that it's just too difficult to separate out all the other things that are going on, and so it's an extremely uncertain measurement. So if we plot those two together, this is what they look like. So here's what the Gaussian looks like. The Gaussian is narrower and more peaked. The Lorentzian is broader, wider wings. Those are both normalized uh, underneath the curve. So if we think we're going to combine these two processes, you have to think this way. Okay? At any particular location in the Doppler profile, Okay, that's a spectral location. That's a class of molecules that has a specific velocity, right? Those are going to respond with their own Lorentzian profile. They're gonna, they, they can be collision broadened just the same as any other molecules. So that class, that velocity class, is uh, collisionally broadened, okay? But that happens for each location. For each particular velocity class, there is Lorentzian broadening. So the overall uh, line shape function is a convolution between the two because of that. It's not an overlap integral, it's a convolution. So th that function, the function, the, the overlap, I'm sorry, the convolution of a Lorentzian with a Gaussian is called a Voigt function, and I'm probably all of you have heard of that before. And uh, you, just, you just do a convolution between the two forms and you get this function where that's the Doppler width down there. The Voigt function, that V right there, is given by this. And the non-dimensional detuning parameter X, see the X up in there, is given by that. Okay, this is, uh, this is the frequency you're at, and that's the frequency of the transition. Now, in the, in what we mean here is the absolute stick spectrum frequency of the, of the transition. And this non-dimensional broadening parameter A is given by this. It's really a ratio of the widths of the, of the uh, Lorentzian and Gaussian profiles. MATLAB and Mathematica both will make a Voigt profile for you if you want to. It's easy. They're, both of them have uh, different ways to do that, fairly efficient calculations. You just give it a value for A. Remember, A is the uh, ratio, really, it's the ratio of the Lorentzian to the Doppler. As you change A, uh, this is for more uh, Doppler looking, this is for more Lorentzian looking. You change A, you get this. Makes sense. And you can get it as a, as a range of detuning. I, I just use Mathematica to make that really quickly. So how do you use this thing? If you know the line broadening parameters for a molecule, Okay, you can simulate realistic line shapes, and it, you can do it in these very easy to use utilities. It's not hard. Uh, people sometimes don't know the broadening parameters, and then what they typically do is, if you really need to know these things, like people who do resolved uh, diode absorption spectroscopy, things like that, they want to know what those are, and so they measure them, 
And once you've measured those things, that gives you another paper anyway. So you get two papers out of one project. But you have to recognize that the measured line shape function is also a function of instrument broadening. Okay, so you're gonna you're gonna measure a line shape function, but it's a it's also a function of uh, the bandwidth of the system that's making the measurement, and you have to be careful about that. And, and so you have to be able to deconvolve the contribution of say the laser line widths and other things like that uh, to make sure that you get an accurate measurement of the line width. Usually what you try to do is make the instrument broadening extremely narrow, so it's negligible compared to the line shape. Sometimes you can get away with that. When it's not possible, you actually have to know what the instrument broadening is and deconvolve it. Uh, and that's, that adds uh, uncertainty to the measurement. But let's say you have, the, uh, you have a clean line shape that you've measured. If you want to separate the homogeneous in the inhomogeneous functions, um, let's say you let's say if you know the temperature, you can calculate the the Doppler broadening. So let's say you want to get the uh, the pressure broadening coefficients. You have to deconvolve them, and you can do that easily with Fourier transforms. So you use the convolution theorem that says if you take the FFT of a Lorentzian times the FFT of a Gaussian, and then you inverse that, you get a Voigt function. So you can you can do the opposite of that, going the other direction, and use nonlinear curve fitting. Knowing what the Doppler profile looks like, you can try to extract uh, collision broadened information if you need to know it. So how do you use all this? Well, uh, there's several ways to do it. Uh, if you want to model absorption or fluorescence, if you want to model the spectrum, you need to model the spectral locations, you need to know the populations and the energy levels, the, the uh, line strength, and then the broadening. So everything we talked about today, you would put together in a model, and then you can model a spectrum, a realistic spectrum. And people sometimes do that, and then do nonlinear fitting to extract, uh, say, the concentration or something, like temperatures and that kind of thing. You can fit that to a measured spectrum, and then extract this information. I think I just said that. How do you find data? Well, for rotation, for infrared data, there's this thing called the HITRAN database. Anybody ever heard of that? Uh, there's a thing called HITRAN high temp, which is supposed to be for high temperatures. Now, HITRAN is uh, it's hosted at Harvard University. And one time when I was in charge of a conference, I invited the man who's in charge of HITRAN, his name is Larry Rothman, to come to our conference where people whine all the time about how bad HITRAN is. And those of you who know about HITRAN have probably heard all the whining, especially HITRAN high temp. And so Larry came, and, he, and he, he gave a great presentation. And at the end of it, he said, look, I'm just one guy. you know, And I know it's not perfect. Don't beat me up. And he, what he said was, if you get high quality data that will improve HITRAN, especially high temp, send it to him. Don't bitch, send him the data. <laughs> so everywhere I go, I repeat what he said, because it's like, it's unfair of everybody to beat up on this one poor physicist, right? It's not fair. Everybody knows high trans got problems, so don't whine about it. If you measure something, like as I was just telling you, send him the measurements. And when he gets a chance, he'll incorporate them and improve high trans. OK, so that was my rant. Hertzberg's got a lot of good data. LiftBase has got a, look, a lot of good data. This book, uh, Applied Combustion Diagnostics, it's unfortunately a little bit old. It has a lot of stuff on established techniques. In fact, uh, 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 Kermit uh, Smith, who used to work at NIST in the United States, he's retired now. He did the, one of the first chapters on LIF. He had this multi-page table on, on every LIF study ever for which molecules what lines they pumped, how successful it was. It was a fantastic table. Unfortunately, you see it's more than 10 years old and more has been done, so it's too bad we can't update that table, but it's still a very useful piece of information. And next we'll talk about absorption-based techniques, but that will be tomorrow. Are there any questions? Uh, 
yes, if you, if you know, oh, can the dependence of collisional broadening be, uh, uh, dependence of it on pressure be calculated? You have to know the, those broadening parameters I mentioned, but if you know those, yes. You can just plug them straight in, and so it's depressing. If you, if you go through the numbers, you, you watch this line, you go, when the pressure gets up. When we get up to the pressures of a piston engine or something like that, they're just like, they're shot. It's depressing. Other questions? Okay, we'll see you again tomorrow.